Hey there, so for years now, I've been making fun of the idea that Russia is winning or Vladimir Putin is some kind of geopolitical mastermind. There is a specter haunting Europe. The Russian bear has awoken and presents a new threat to peace and security. In almost three years of Machiavellian politics and nonlinear warfare, Russia has taken over very little of a country that's basically half Russian? Never mind. In the Baltics, Russia's overbearing power has succeeded in dramatically accelerating NATO's militarization of the Russian border? Um, uh... Russia's forays into Libya, and especially Syria, are less straightforwardly embarrassing, but the way they seem to have set up a Russo-Turkish Cold War are a tremendous strategic gift to the United States. Two hyper-nationalist regional powers that want to compete but aren't serious enough about it to go to war are actually perfect for offshore balancing. If only anybody in Washington, D.C. was smart enough to notice. Washington, D.C. would rather use Russia to scare taxpayers into paying for more defense spending, which makes the oversight I want to talk about today all the more surprising. Last fall, Russia brought about its greatest victory in the rogue Russia era. I really don't get why we aren't talking more about the Russian role in Armenia and Azerbaijan. It really was a tremendous victory. Seriously. And Russia didn't even have to fire a shot. Unlike the United States, a country that hasn't had a sensible foreign policy goal since 1989, Russia is pretty explicit about its goals. It regrets the loss of the empire built by the Tsars, and it wants to preserve its influence in all the Soviet republics it lost with the breakup of the USSR in 1991. All of Russia's biggest breaks with the West were about their objections to growing Western influence in these post-Soviet regions. The 2008 invasion of Georgia was about stopping NATO, and the Crimea and Eastern Ukraine interventions were a response to a pro-EU coup the U.S. organized or at least endorsed in that country in 2014. The Georgia and Ukraine interventions were, quite rightly, huge international news. But they were also huge losers for Russia. The 2014 interventions led to sanctions, of course, but they also led to massive resentment of Russia across the Russian periphery. The Baltics now have many more NATO troops on the ground, and it's really hard to imagine Russia ever rebuilding goodwill in the majority of Ukraine. What happened last fall was very, very different. The region has many frozen conflicts, but the one that unfroze so dramatically last fall was different. For one thing, it involved a conflict between two separate states, rather than a Russian-supported enclave versus a state like Georgia, Moldova, or eastern Ukraine. In this case, Armenia was occupying a separate enclave on what international law recognized as the territory of Azerbaijan. Also, this Armenian-held Azeri territory had two different statuses. There was Nagorno-Karabakh, a traditionally Armenian territory within Azerbaijan that most of the world thinks deserves some level of self-government and a relationship with Armenia. There were also a number of territories surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh that absolutely nobody who wasn't Armenian believed belonged to Armenia. Something else that only Armenians failed to recognize was how unsustainable the status quo was before last fall's war. 25 years ago, when both countries were newly independent from the Soviet Union, the Armenians won a war. They won that war because of the tremendous edge in nation building and military funding that they got from the fairly wealthy Armenian diaspora. Over the past 25 years, that advantage and funding has disappeared completely. As Azerbaijan consolidated itself, its oil and gas industry became more and more internationally important, and the country became vastly richer than Armenia. Azerbaijan poured this money into military equipment. So by last fall, not only did Azerbaijan have three times as many people as Armenia, it also had a much more modern and powerful military. 
The war went pretty much as you would expect. The only surprising thing is how quickly it happened. In around 40 days, Azerbaijan used Turkish and Israeli drones to crush Armenian resistance. And it looked like they were on the cusp of taking over all of Nagorno-Karabakh and probably driving out its historic Armenian population. Now, when this was happening, I thought this was deeply embarrassing for Russia. Armenia is a member of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, a sort of a budget Russia-centered imitation of NATO. To have one of the six members of this organization losing a war was humiliating for Russia. Or at least that's what I thought. Until Russia picked the perfect moment to jump in. Armenia was losing badly, and Azerbaijan was in the difficult position where the next step was massacre and ethnic cleansing, something that would have made it a lot harder to sell oil internationally. So both countries invited Russia back in. Russia now has a stepped-up military presence in Armenia and a completely new military presence in Azerbaijan, protecting what's left of Nagorno-Karabakh. As a face-saving measure, Turkey supposedly has some role policing the ceasefire too, but that strikes me as pretty meaningless. It's not like the Turks will be allowed to set foot in Armenia or Nagorno-Karabakh, while the Russians are to some extent trusted by all. The Collective Security Treaty Organization now looks pretty damn real. Not only did Russia reoccupy strategically significant parts of two former Soviet republics, the international community was actually pretty grateful that it did so, even if we don't want to admit it. Nobody wanted to see large numbers of Armenian civilians getting killed or displaced, but nobody else was willing to do anything to stop it. Supposedly, this Russian military deployment is going to end in five years' time, but I don't think they're going anywhere in any of our lifetimes. Let's zoom out and look at the big picture. The post-Soviet republics that are central to Russian foreign policy can be divided into three chunks. In the West, Russia has lost pretty comprehensively. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are all now members of the EU and NATO. Belarus is still Russia-aligned, but it's home to a lot fewer people than its size indicates, just 10 million and falling, and, and even that relationship with Russia is looking a little shaky nowadays. Russia has carved a few scraps off of Ukraine, but at the cost of turning most of its 44 million people against Russia forever. The stands make for a lot less dramatic news, but the Russian position in the East may be even worse than in the West. For now, the legacy of Russian Empire still has surprising power, but it's China that is going to matter out here in the future. Russia and China may be facing similar population demographic issues, but China is going to continue to be able to operate on a scale that far surpasses Russia. China's trillion dollars worth of Belt and Road infrastructure investments are a minor concern for the United States, but they are a knife across the jugular of Russia's influence in the eastern post-Soviet republics. Russia's sinking prospects elsewhere make these three central post-Soviet republics all the more important. This is Russia's soft underbelly. Chechnya, a province Russia almost lost in the 1990s, is just over the border from Georgia. In the 1990s, the 2000s and 2010s, this region was a topic of intense geopolitical interest. Russia invaded Georgia in 2008, leading to great resentment and greater U.S. and European inroads. Armenia's Prime Minister Pashinyan rose to power in 2018 on a partially anti-Russian platform of friendliness to the West. Well, all of that's over now. I thought about doing the research and animation necessary to describe the complicated politics of Georgia, but really, why bother? It's a country of four million people, and it is now surrounded on almost every border by countries that are occupied by Russian soldiers to some degree. The competition for this post-Soviet region is over, and Russia won. Russia really needed a win, and they got it.
In recent weeks, border disputes between Armenia and Azerbaijan have prompted Armenian Prime Minister Pashinyan to formally request intervention by the CSTO, making that organization look even more important and making it pretty clear that Russia will be garrisoning that border for a lot more than just five years. This should allow Russia to focus more of their diminishing resources on the eastern and western fronts, where they are perpetually falling behind. Honestly, the Russian victory here is kind of stunning. They've completely met their goals in one of the three post-Soviet regions, and they've sort of taken it off the board when it comes to competition with the West and China. But nobody's really talking about it that way. Why is that? Well, I think it might be conflicting narratives. Washington, D.C. wants you to be scared of Russia. But it also wants you to be scared of anything else it can use to drive up defense budgets. Terrorists, narcos, UFOs, even climate change. They want you scared. Fear is the goal, not an accurate picture of anything. And if a good story gets in the way of a legitimate analysis of a problem that is troubling in a more serious way, U.S. media will go with the good story every time. In recent years, Washington, D.C. has gotten more and more interested in an anti-Turkey narrative. Nothing gets people more angry at Turkey than thinking about what they did to the Armenians. So D.C. is selling Azerbaijan's victory over Armenia as a Turkish victory, even though Turkey kind of got played by Russia here. When Armenia loses, it's just scarier if the Turks can be made out to be the bad guys instead of the Russians. It's that simple and it's that stupid. So Russia's biggest victory in decades isn't even acknowledged to be Russian. I think we need to try to see beyond Washington, D.C. propaganda, because we don't understand the world at all if we don't. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And I'd be grateful if you considered signing up for my email newsletter as well. You'll get a free PDF essay if you do. Thanks.